but the notes are relatively simple today. Um, so we talked yesterday about, or, or Tuesday, about asymptotes. And particularly, one of the things we talked about, vertical asymptotes happen where our denominator is zero, but our numerator is not zero. And so the thing was, we said, I said, hey, we're going to talk about this coming up. What if it is zero in both? Well, that's what we're getting today. If an x value is zero in both the numerator and the denominator, then f of x, then x at f of x, that xy coordinate, is a hole in the graph. And this is the problem that we had doing uh, graphing the other day, is that when you do graph them with holes, graphing calculators don't show holes. You can't see them. Um, Desmos, which does a great job of graphing, doesn't show holes either. They don't put a little hole in there. Okay, and, and, and so the holes are not shown on graphing. So you have to be able to know how to do them without that. Okay. If you have a zero in the numerator and a zero in the denominator at the same time, that means you have a hole. The line's going, going, the graph is going along, and then, oop, you got a little open spot because it doesn't exist there. But it's not an asymptote. An asymptote happens where it's undefined, period. This one is going along as everything's all nice and happy dandy, but there's a gap in it, just a little hole in the graph. Now, to find where that hole is, the x-coordinate comes from the zeros. The y-coordinate comes from, you plug that in, your, your zero, into the simplified version of the equation. So what you do is you plug it into the simplified version of the equation. So I will demonstrate what that is. So the idea on these problems is that we're going to find all asymptotes and holes, all the fancy important stuff on a graph. Okay. So to help us out on this one, first thing you want to do is factor it. If you factor it out, it really works well. Anytime you have any kind of a, a rational function, if you can factor it, that's going to be the best thing you can do. So my numerator, if you factor it out, you get 2x minus 1 and x minus 2 and in the denominator you get x plus 2 x minus 2. And this tells you an awful lot. It tells you your zeros, tells you your, your asymptotes, all that stuff along those lines. You can get those from here. Okay, between the original and the factored version that really works well. So where are my zeros? I have a zero at negative two from this one and a zero of positive two at that one. Are either one of those zeros not zeros in my numerator? Negative two. So that means at negative two, what do I have going on? I've got a vertical asymptote at x equals negative two. Wherever I have a zero in the denominator and it's not zero in my numerator, I have a vertical asymptote. Okay. My other zero, what other zero do I have? I have x equals 2, which is a zero in both. So what's going on there? We got a hole in the graph. So we have a hole at the coordinate 2, because that's the x coordinate. That's not the y coordinate, that is the x coordinate at 2, and then to figure out where, to figure out the y-coordinate, what do we do? We take the simplified version of this equation, which is 2x minus 1 over x plus 2. Because we cancel out the common factors, we simplify it down. You use that simplified one in order to find out where the hole is. So I simplify it out, I plug in 2, I get 3 over 4, so it's at the point 2 and 3 quarters. Yes? Can you just 
I do not have it ready, but I can pull it up and go. Okay, I've got another graph, but it's for the second problem. Because it won't look, like I said, there won't be a hole there. It'll just be the graph, the equation, it'll pass right through it. You will not be able to tell on the equation what it looks like. So, I took this x coordinate, plugged it into the simplified version of that equation. So I can't, if I cancel these two factors out, I get this, I plugged it into that. Now here's what's really cool. If you graph these two equations, actually let's, let's pause on that for a second. So what's the other thing we want to do? We want to see if we have any horizontal asymptotes or oblique asymptotes. So for those, what do I do? I look at the, degree, the highest power on each of them. 2x squared over 2x squared simplifies down into 2. So my horizontal asymptote is at y equals 2. Now here's what's really cool. The graph for the original problem and the graph for the simplified problem are exactly the same except for one thing. The whole. They're exactly the same except for one thing. The whole. Because if I take this and simplify it down, these are equivalent functions. Any numbers I plug into here will give me the exact same results if I plug them into here. Take any x, plug it into there, and plug it into here, you get the same y value for any one of them. Except for one place where the whole is. Everything else is exactly the same. That's why some rational functions actually graph out to be straight lines. They don't have any asymptotes at all. They graph out to be straight lines. That's where the zero in your denominator is also a zero in your numerator. And it just graphs out to be a nice little straight line. And then you end up with that hole in there, though. Like I said, you graph this, you put it on the graphing, you, you graph it up, you still don't have, it will not show the hole on the graphing thing. It will not do that. So. Oh, where's the delete? Two x squared minus five x plus two in parentheses divided by and here's the nice thing about Desmos is it automatically puts everything up and the next thing automatically goes down x squared minus four x squared minus four. So that's what the graph looks like. And like I said, what don't you see? You don't see the hole. The hole was at what? It was at two and three quarters. So right here, right here, or sorry, right here, there's a hole. There's an open space right there. It doesn't show it, but there's an open space right there. Doesn't matter how much you zoom in, it will not show that there's a hole there. It's just the product of the, of the, of the graph. It shows your asymptotes. Your asymptotes are there. You don't see them because you got to draw the lines if you want to have to show up on there for sure. But you can tell that it's asymptotic here. It goes up, it goes up, it flattens out, it flattens out. But the hole is not done on the graphing gate, so you can't see it. And your graphing calculator doesn't do it either. Okay, So it's not just Desmos' thing on that one. It's also, that's just what it is. Okay? And, it, and, this, and I understand it's hard to show a hole. It's really hard to show a hole because they work in discrete values and it's really hard to do the way that the, the way the programs are written and the way the computers are it's really hard to do. So let's take a look at the other example. Same idea. First thing you want to do is try and factor or find the zeros. Okay. 
Um, I have already factored the numerator for you and the denominator. So here's what I want you to do. Take a minute. Find any old vertical asymptotes. Find any holes. And either and in either your oblique or horizontal asymptotes. So you have one new thing, the rest of it's all reviewed from yesterday. So take a couple of minutes and do that. Find all asymptotes and holes. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is look at, hor at vertical asymptotes and holes. We get that from our denominator. We have a 0 at negative 1 and a 0 at negative 2. Negative 1 is not a 0 in our numerator, so that means we have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. Negative 2 is a zero on our numerator as well. So we don't have a vertical asymptote. We have a hole at that point. So at negative two and let's see, put negative two in the unfactored version, or I should say the reduced. That will give us x minus one, x minus three, and x plus one. If I put negative two into there, it gives us negative 3 and negative 5 and negative 1, which gives us negative 15. No, because it's a negative 5 and a negative 3 and then negative 1. Three negatives multiplied together give you a negative. Yeah. I had to double check when I was doing the notes earlier. So. And do I have a horizontal asymptote? No. Do I have an oblique asymptote? Yes. Now remember, for your oblique asymptotes, they only happen when the numerator, the degree of the numerator is one more than the degree of the denominator. If the numerator has a much higher degree than the denominator, you don't have an oblique one. It only happens when the degree is one more. I have x cubed over x squared that is oblique. If it was x to the fourth over x squared, I would not have an oblique one. Okay. So now you have to find that. Well, I need to do division. Now, you can do synthetic division providing one thing. You can reduce it first. So this one can be reduced. That's what I did here. I simplified it down. I, re I, I, I factored it, canceled. I have a reduced fraction. And if I FOIL that out, I end up with x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x plus 1. Right? That's the simplified version of my original problem. I can find my oblique asymptote from that, or I can find it from the original one. It would be the same one. Because remember, both of those graphs could be the same thing. So I can do it from here, which means I can go negative 1 to 1, negative 4, 3, and I get 1, negative 1, negative 5, 5, and 8. But that 8 is irrelevant because I don't care about my um, remainder. Thank you. So I have, a hor I have an oblique asymptote, OA, at y equals negative x minus 5. Positive x. You're right. You're right. I don't know why I saw the negative. Thank you very much. Sorry. My bad. My mistake is recorded for posterity. Let's not say we did. Okay. Questions? It's the only thing that's new so far is the holes. That's not that big a deal. Now we get to the fun problem. Okay. Now, 
here's the deal, and and this is an important thing to know. Okay, um, in a previous work life, I spent several years working at a fisheries, fish processing plant. We unloaded the boats, processed the fish, sent it on its way on trucks and stuff like that. Okay, all kinds of things. Well, when you buy your food nowadays, what's on the back of every single packaged product you buy? Nutritional label. Those nutritional the ingredients have been there for forever. The nutritional labels have only haven't been there that long. I was working in the fisheries when the nutritional labeling laws came out. And one of my jobs was to decide which products we had to put the labels on and which ones we didn't, because we were generally speaking a wholesale company. We we filleted the fish, put it in bags, or we froze it and put it in bags and sent it off to stores and, and stuff. But generally they didn't they didn't sell a whole ten pound bag of fillets in the store. They you know in the restaurants you don't have to worry about. Some of our products, however, were canned. We did canned crab and canned shrimp and we actually did some canned albacore as well. So I had to figure out all the labeling laws, which ones applied, which ones didn't. And I'm going to tell you the size of the label is determined by the size of the packaging. So on cans, it's determined by the size of the label going outside. How big that label is determines the size of the label and what has to be on the label. Now there are minimums for everything, but you'll see on some things they have just the minimums and some things they have a lot more information that depends upon the size of packaging. That was one of my jobs. So working with stuff like this is important. And I like this one. This is a real, real lead into something you're going to be doing next year is trying to figure out a maximization or minimization. Okay, So, um, the Reynolds Metal Company manufactures aluminum cans with a capacity of 500 cubic centimeters. 500 milliliters, right? Okay. The top and bottom are made of aluminum alloy. They cost 0.05 cents per centimeter squared. The sides are made of a material that only costs 0.02 centimeters per squared. Express the cost C of the material as a function of R, the radius. So we have a couple of things going on here. So the first part, the C based on the radius. This is why I love function notation. Cost based on R, C of R, is equal to top and bottom are easy. How much, do they, how much is it per square centimeter for the top and bottom? What do they say? 0.05 cents. So I have 0.05 times, and the top and bottom are what kind of, what, what, what kind of geometric objects? Circles. So I have the area of the top is pi r squared. The area of the bottom is pi r squared. So how many pi r squared do I have? I have two. Pi r squared. But pi aren't really squared in the round. It's squared to cobbler. Plus, okay, how much does it cost for the sides of the can? 0 0.02, thinner metal. That's not an unusual thing. Times the surface area of the side. And I like this cutout here. So this is the can, but when you cut it out and you lay it out, what do you get? Well, you get the height of it times the circumference. The circumference going around is equal to this length here. So this this lateral area is, is the circumference to pi r times the height. Does that make sense? Now we got a problem. We always have problems. Some of us have more than others. Okay. Here's the problem. How? No, no, that, that's irrelevant. Uh, why is it two pi r pi? Because how tall is the can? Because if we do this, the height here and this distance here is two pi r. Because we're only finding 
We're not finding the volume, we're finding the surface area. Right. No, it's 2 pi r. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, problem is I have how many variables in there and how many do I want? Have I have two variables in the equation, but I only need one. I can't work with two, I need one. I need r only, not h. And h is still at this time a variable. However, we have another piece of information we have not used. Yeah. So that means my volume. And the volume of a can is pi r squared h. And what is the volume of our can? It's 500, so I replace v with pi r squared h. So, fi sorry, 500 equals pi r squared h. Solve that for h. Divide both sides by pi r squared. And I get 500 divided by pi r squared is equal to h. So now I can put that in for h. <laughs> Trust me, it's not as nasty as it looks. C r is equal to 0.5 times 2 is 0.05 times 2 is 1. Point 0.1? Yeah, I wrote it down to make sure. So I get 0 0.1 pi r squared plus 2 times 0 0.02. Well, actually, let me do some replacing first here. So I end up with 0 0.02 times 2 pi r, and then I have 500 over pi r squared, because that's what h is. Substitute that in for H, and now I can clean it up really quickly. C of R, 0 0.1 pi R squared plus, and then 0 0.2 times 2 times 500 gives us 20. And then what happens to our pi R's? The pi's cancel. The pi's cancel. And one of the R's cancel, so I'm just left with R, so I get 20 over R. Yeah. 0 0.2, 0 0.02 times 2 times 500 gives us the 20. The pi and the R cancel. The pi in the numerator and denominator cancel. The R over R squared reduces to R in the denominator. So that's what you get. That's your equation. It starts nasty and it gets something that's really simple to work with. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to find this. So, what does part B say? It says, graph the function. Wow. I graphed the function. Yeah, so you can do things. If, I'm not going to ask you to do something you cannot do without a calculator. I'm not going to ask you to do something that you cannot do without your calculators on the test. There's more to this problem than just that. Okay. Now, so when I first graphed this problem, I'm like, whoa, that can't be right. That's because my window wasn't as large as my window here is. Because all I saw was the stuff less than zero, which doesn't actually work, does it? Can I have a negative radius or negative volume or negative cost? Yeah. No, I can't, because your x-axis is the radius, your y-axis is the cost. And I can't have that. That's fine. You just have to recognize I have a limit on what I can do. Okay? I have a limit on what I can do. If my I cannot have a negative radius, I cannot have a negative I cannot have a negative radius. So everything less than zero does not count. On the other side though, I can do that. Now, if this was a question you could do your calculator on, you could do this just fine. Once you graph it, find the point at the lowest value, that's your minimum. It says where is your least amount of cost, right? If this is a graph, my y is my cost, where's my minimum? So you find your minimum. And 
to answer the question. The B is, or the C is, what revalue of R is? So that, that's the X coordinate. So the X coordinate, 3.169. Okay. So 3.169 centimeters, approximately. And then what is the least cost? That's the Y value of that, which is 9.47 cents because our units was in cents so it cost you about cost about nine and a half cents per can no that's not no 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 that's pennies and trust me working work work no working in the industrial business yes they do things in cents and they will also do them in dollars, but they will do it down to this plastic bag will cost you point zero 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 five dollars. It will cost you a half a penny for this plastic bag. How many thousands of them do you want? And they do quote prices for individual things. So saying that it can individually cost nine cents, nine and a half cents for one can is important. Because if I do 9.47, and if I can reduce this cost, if actually it was less than that, let's say nine points, you know, three five cents, that's a big deal when you're putting out a million cans. That's a lot of money. Think about how many cans a Pepsi puts out every year. If they could save a a, ten, a a hundredth of a penny per can, that's billions of dollars on the bottom line. So it does make a difference. It wouldn't for you know, somebody doing it, but it does make a difference when you're selling an awful lot. So it is important to do that. Okay, that is serious. When you're looking at industry, that's a lot of money. Okay, and the units were originally given to us in pennies or in cents. Yeah, that's not dollars; it's cents because we worked. What are our original units? Our original units were cents, cents per centimeter squared. So that's how much they are in cents. 